Welcome back to Globetrotting, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already. The concept of aircraft launching is always fascinating. Some aircraft are born more routinely than others. Meanwhile, some are actually born purely out of panic of losing market share in critical sectors. The Airbus A350 was conceived in response to Boeing's 787 Dreamliner, which posed a threat to Airbus's own market share, particularly impacting the already existing A330 and that important long-haul market, which it had already been performing well in and growing. Worse still, Airbus initially didn't actually perceive the 787 as a threat to them. They weren't worried about this entering the industry. They were well known and documented to have believed that their established A330 could fend off the Dreamliner. While the A330 was yes established at the time of the 787's introduction, the Dreamliner really brought a first glimpse into what the new era would look like and very quickly began to thrive in the space. And as a result, unsurprisingly, alarm bells then began to start ringing at Airbus. They needed something. And while that something would be the A350, it wasn't actually initially first what was planned. See, Airbus's first response involved considering enhancements to the A330. If it could develop a new A330 derivative that would compete with the 787, this would not only be quick and efficient, but would be the best possible scenario in terms of resource management. This preliminary concept was actually not the A330neo, but rather an improved version of the existing model known as the A330 Lite. However, as customer feedback poured in, it became very clear that these little incremental improvements wouldn't be ideal in battling the 787 that was a clean sheet and brought along with it so many new features. Whatever design Airbus was going to go with had to be new and had to have improvements across the board. Recognising the necessity of this, they opted down the route of a clean sheet. They knew this would take more resources, but ultimately they couldn't sit back. They came up with the A350, aimed at slotting into the long-haul market, and it ended up being a departure in terms of their decision-making from from, say, improving existing models to creating a new aircraft that would be able to meet what customers expected. They looked to incorporate carbon fiber, new engines, and a great design to ensure that their A350 was favored in order considerations. One of the more important aspects of the A350's development was actually Airbus's willingness to listen to customers and their feedback. This is something we also witnessed with the Boeing 777 and the involvement of many airlines in the building process of this aircraft. Basically, airlines were allowed to have their say and went on to eventually purchase the plane, as it was perfect for them. This customer feedback for the A350 was actually important because we witnessed a design change in the mid 2000s that allowed for greater configuration flexibility inside the cabin alongside other improvements that airlines were requesting. If Airbus changed it, these airlines would go on to purchase the plane. And without realizing it, the A350 very quickly became more of a 777 competitor. So while it did slot into the long haul market, and yes, the 787 and A350 at times have been pitted against each other as options for airlines' fleets, soon it also became possible to have both of these aircraft types in your long haul operation if you were a large airline. They both could complete very different missions, but work together. Either way, the A350 marked a new era for Airbus. Initially, the plane was offered in three variants. The A350-800 was intended on being the smallest variant. However, it had pretty limited customer interest, and Airbus eventually decided they would cancel this and move forward with the A330neo. The A350-900 acts as the baseline model and has become really popular as the middle ground for range, capacity, and efficiency. Moving upwards, if you're after a plane with extended capabilities while well, the A350-1000 is there for you. With an extended fuselage, it can accommodate more passengers and compete better with, say, the upcoming 777X. Since its debut, the 350 has been well-received. There have been niggles here and there, including the early 2020s when we saw that paint saga with Qatar Airways, but generally the fuel efficiency has been praised alongside your passenger experience. You'd hope, though, because the A350 is part of the that next-gen fleet that really focuses on limiting jet lag and making the flying experience as best as possible. 
Remember, these planes can sometimes fly up to 20 hours and soon longer, especially with Qantas' upcoming Project Sunrise missions, and therefore, they need to be comfortable. There needs to be space, oversized windows, and all these features to make sure customers don't hate flying on it. That wouldn't reflect well on the aircraft, but especially not the airline. The A350 would first enter service with Qatar Airways in the mid-2010s, and its adoption was rapid from there, with numerous airlines placing orders, seeing what it was doing and incorporating it into their fleets wherever possible. The development of the aircraft has also been huge. We've seen the A350 ULR variant showcase its capabilities with Singapore Airlines, using it to fly on the world's longest non-stop routes from its hub in Changi through to the likes of New York and more. Flights such as these brought back the age of ultra-long-haul travel, and with it now being possible in a more efficient manner. While these flights are a marathon for customers, it was a new opportunity for airlines to tap into markets that they previously couldn't reach, or maybe ones that they were returning to without a single stop, and doing so in a much more profitable manner. In recent years, Airbus has expanded the A350 family by introducing the A350 freighter only a couple of years ago. The A350F is aimed at capturing the freighter market, deemed as incredibly lucrative, but also more importantly traditionally dominated by Boeing, who have amassed quite a portfolio of jets for this freight sector. Airbus knew they needed to compete with Boeing. This was one of the last markets that they had failed so badly in. The A350F builds upon the success that has already been enjoyed with the passenger variants, and many would argue is the plane maker's first genuine attempts to battle Boeing. What better time than with the entry of next-gen freighters? The A350F is expected to enter service in the coming years, permitting certification, and has already amassed orders, but, but on a more critical note, it has actually been able to challenge against Boeing for orders in the same sentence, equally. Therefore, for the first time, really showcasing what Airbus hopes to achieve for the long term. Discussions around the future are always important too, and how can you fend off competition? Therefore, it's probably no shock that at the late 2010s, which was pretty early considering the A350 had just entered service, we saw our first reporting of an A350neo. Nothing in the end was fabricated, but there was a lot of reputable reporting regarding engine studies for a new engine option that later down the line would be able to enhance the 350's platform, which still remains a possibility. The 350 has been a resounding success, but really one of the questions I pose to you is whether industry advancements can outpace the need for a new A350 with, say, a radically different design. Would that arrive sooner than the need for a new 350? Let me know. Either way, as engine manufacturers become more sustainable and launch new powerful engines, it's always worth considering for the manufacturer, even if it doesn't go Go ahead. For now though, the backlog is considerable and airlines are looking to tie down deliveries through to the 2030s to ensure that they have those slots available for when they need them. Funnily enough, born out of fear of Boeing that was maybe misjudged, the 350 has stuck the landing since arriving on the scene. The development of the A350F and A350-1000 for Qantas promise new opportunities for Airbus to showcase the program's future untapped potential for the long term. And that's the A350. Let me know your thoughts down below in the comments. Thank you very much for your support here on the channel. If you'd like to see me take a look at another aircraft in a similar fashion, you can also let me know down below in the comments. Subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you in a couple of days for more aviation analysis right here on Globetrotting. And we'll fly.